The intent of this video is to discuss formation flying adopted by the B-17 bombers in World War II. Bombers flew in a tight, disciplined, synchronized, and predetermined manner. The formations flew as if they were collectively in harmony, as if they were joined together. There were 11 bomber formations adopted by the 8th Army Air Forces in World War II. This chart represents the formation name, characteristics of the formation, and the dates the formations were active. The formations were modified throughout the war to address lessons learned and taking into account the changing threat, minimizing crew losses, and maximizing bombing accuracy. I will be focusing in on the two most prevalent formations, number 7 and number 8. The seventh formation, called the More Compact Combat Wing, was active from April 1943 to December 1943. This formation was adopted prior to long-range fighter escort and was flown during the famous Schweinfurt-Regensburg and the follow-up Schweinfurt II mission. The 8th Air Force suffered its highest loss rate at 28% during the Schweinfurt II while bearing factory bombing raid in October 1943. This chart represents 8th Army Air Force bomber attrition. The x-axis of the chart represents the month and year. The y-axis represents percent bombers lost or percent bombers lost on a defined mission. The 8th formation was called the 36th Aircraft Group and was implemented throughout all of 1944. This formation was adopted to take advantage of the availability of long-range fighter escort, the widespread use of radar bombing in foul weather, and to reduce pilot fatigue. This formation was adopted during the February 1944 Big Week and the March 6, 1944 Berlin bombing raid, where 72 bombers were lost. This represented the largest loss of any single mission. This chart represents the number of bombers lost. The x-axis of the chart represents the month and year, the y-axis represents the daily average bombers lost, or the bombers lost on the mission listed. Bombers flew in formation for various reasons. The main doctrine was to increase the defensive firepower of the formation flying unit. Each B-17 was armed with 11 to 13 Browning M2 50 caliber machine guns. Each gun was capable of firing up to 14 rounds per second at an effective distance of 600 yards. Each bomber was positioned in the formation providing specific area coverage and were in turn provided mutual coverage by the other airplanes in the formation. Germans found it difficult to attack a well-disciplined formation. An 18 aircraft combat box formation could bring up to 234 guns to bear. Germans adopted training aids to illustrate the arc travel of each of the bomber's gun stations. When the aircrews adopted tracers in the ammo mix, a visible cone of fire would rain 50 caliber armor-piercing rounds upon the attacker from the formation. Each bomber gun station was effective within a specific arc travel, and there were turret cam followers and cutoff fire switches to keep the gunners from shooting their own airplane. This needed to be taken into account when setting up aircraft positions within the formations. The bomber's upper turret and ball turret were especially effective gun platforms since they incorporated Sperry's K3, K4 automatic computing gun sight. The gun sight accounted for deflection, lead, and bullet drop. One issue the bombers faced was a limited forward-facing firepower of the formations. The bombardiers and navigators' cheat guns did not have full forward-facing arc range. The ball turret cam followers would not allow firing through the propellers, and the upper turret's guns could not be depressed below zero degrees. The Germans exploited this limited forward-facing firepower of the formations by attacking the formations head-on. Based on this vulnerability, the later B-17G models incorporated a Bendix chin turret to add additional forward-facing firepower. Bomber gunners were taught to open fire at a farther thousand yards during forward-facing fighter attacks. This was also due to the minimum deflection needed and the 600 miles per hour closing speed between the bomber and fighter. Both the bomber and fighter had only about three seconds of clear firing time in head-on attacks before interceptor breakaway. The careful position of the bombers in the formations increased the interlocking gun coverage zone, maximizing firepower against interceptors. Other formation considerations included adequate bomber dispersion defense against ground artillery anti-aircraft flak fire. 
The best formations for flak resistance is to fly a horizontal spread and pass over the flak batteries quickly. However, this formation reduces bomb accuracy and the speeds may be too fast for damaged aircraft to stay within the formation. 50% of all downed bombers were stragglers who left the formation protection. A compact formation increases bomb accuracy but are easier to shoot down by ground artillery flak or air launch standoff rockets and are difficult to fly. The formation needs to also take into account pilot visibility and flying fatigue that comes with the arduous formation flying. Bomber formations need to arrange themselves such that the release bombs do not land on the planes below. The formation also needs to account for falling spent shell casings. The 8th Air Force compiled damage sources of returning bombers from January 1944 through May 1944. The data showed that falling spent shell casings damaged 573 bombers. There is no one-size-fits-all ideal formation. The formations were matured based on the changing battlefield parameters as the war progressed. By the fall of 1943, it became clear that existing bomber formations were inadequate in defending against fighter attacks. A long-range fighter escort was needed. This chart represents the number of destroyed bombers per month due to flak fighters and other. Prior to May 1944, more bombers were destroyed by fighters than flak. From May 1944 and on, more bombers were destroyed by ground artillery flak than fighters. There were two distinct phases of bomber formations, the unescorted bomber formations and the escorted bomber formations. During the first phase, it was up to the bombers to provide their own defense against fighters. This proved not feasible. Fortunately, long-range fighters were available from January 1944 and on. During the second phase, the formation's goal objectives were modified to include ease of escort, ease of maintaining formation, tighter formations for better bomb pattern, and minimize effectiveness of the anti-aircraft gunfire. The bomber attrition loss rate was reduced by one-third after long-range escorts became available. We need to discuss some definitions using the formation number seven, the more compact combat wing for illustrative purposes. Bombers first formed up into elements. Each element consisted of three bombers in a V formation, where the element lead was in front of his two wingmen. The two wingmen were behind the element lead at offset altitudes, like a stair step, generally echelon towards the sun. The wingmen would keep their eyes on the lead and fly in their positions, queuing off of the lead. If the lead made any course corrections, his high and low wingmen followed, always maintaining the self same relative three-dimensional position within the formation element. Formation flying required concentration, and as a consequence, the bomber's flight crew would often swap flight duties every 15 minutes or so. Since the wingmen were flying so close, the element lead was instructed to fly in a predictable manner and no violent evasive maneuvers were allowed. Two elements were combined to make a squadron. A squadron consisted of six airplanes. The elements were positioned as a high forward element and a low back element within the squadron. The high forward element contained the element's lead and also doubled as a squadron's lead. The lower back element lead would fly, queuing off of the squadron's lead. Three squadrons made a group. A group consisted of six elements or 18 bombers. A group is also called a combat box. The group consisted of a lead, high, and low squadron. The lead squadron contained the group lead. The high and low squadrons were in a V formation, yet echelon like a stair step towards the direction of the sun. The two squadron leads flew, queuing off of the group lead. Combining three groups made a combat wing. A combat wing consisted of three combat boxes, nine squadrons, 18 elements, or 54 aircraft total. The combat wing consisted of a lead, high, and low group. The forward group contained the combat box lead plane and deputy lead. The deputy lead would take control of the combat box if the lead could not fulfill his commander obligations. The groups were in a V formation and echelon towards the direction of the sun. In summary, the two element wingmen flew off of their element's lead. The element's lead flew off of the squadron's lead. The squadron's lead flew off of the group lead. The group's lead flew off of the combat wing's lead. 
The Combat Wing's lead navigator charted the course, set altitude, and speed for the entire 54 plane formation. The remaining 53 planes navigators continually mapped their position, but their position was only used if they needed to peel out of the formation and return to base. The Combat Wings flew six miles apart. Only the Combat Wings leader could be on autopilot. The rest of the 53 bombers stayed in their formation positions, jockeying their throttles and flight controls while keeping their eyes on their respective leads. Four minutes prior to reaching the initial point, the IP, the combat wing would break up into the three groups. Each group would separate into three squadrons. Each squadron would sight and drop their bombs over the target at their assigned altitudes in the order of lead, high, and low squadrons. The two elements within the squadrons would still maintain their respective formation positions and all planes would release their bombs when the squadron lead releases its bombs. The squadron lead's first bombs will be dropped with a smoking visual cue and the remaining five bombardiers or toggleers will release their bombs with a toggle switch. Only the squadron lead bombardier is sighting the target. No evasive action can be taken during this run. For a concentrated small target, bombs will be released as a salvo, where all bombs are released at once. For a spread out large target, the bombs will be released in train at predefined in a volometer ground distance settings. After the bomb run, the squadrons would head for the predefined rally point, RP. At the rally point, the three squadrons would reform back into their respective combat boxes and the three combat boxes would reform back up into the 54 airplane combat wing for the return home. The indicated airspeed for the return trip needs to be around 150 to 155 miles per hour to allow damaged bombers to stay in the formation. This graph represents the after action status report of the 18 aircraft combat box formation of the 305th Bombardment Group after the October 14, 1943 Schweinfurt Ball Bearing Factory Raid. Colored in tails represent the damaged airplane in the formation. Colored in fuselages indicate the plane is lost in action. On this mission, 13 of the 18 aircraft were destroyed. Two landed damaged and only three landed without damage. The low squadron was completely wiped out. Miniature bombs stenciled into the side of the Memphis Bell indicated it completed 25 combat missions. The number of swastikas indicate the Bell's gunners were credited with destroying eight German fighters. The yellow stars indicate the Bell was a squadron lead during eight missions, and the red stars indicate the Bell was group lead during those seven missions. The next formation adopted, the 36 aircraft group, replaced the more compact combat wing in January 1944. There were a couple reasons why this smaller 36 aircraft group was adopted. The 54 aircraft combat wing proved difficult to maneuver as a cohesive unit without breaking off element stragglers. This was especially true for the B-24s due to poor pilot visibility. The smaller, tighter formation increased bombing accuracy, took advantage of the long-range fighter escort, and increased the use of radar bombing in foul weather. The defensive firepower was roughly equivalent as less guns were now blocked by other planes in the formation. Fighter escorts flew around 1,500 feet above the bombers and needed to weave back and forth since their cruising speeds exceeded the bombers' formation speeds. An element was still comprised of three aircraft V-formation, but all level, no stair-step staggering. Level flying of elements reduced some of the difficulty in maintaining a tight formation. A squadron doubled in size from two elements to four elements, or six planes to twelve planes. The squadron's four elements took up positions in the lead, high, low, and low, low trailing. This formation brought more guns to bear and increased the flying cohesion of the 12 aircraft squadron. The group or combat box consisted of three squadrons or 36 aircraft. No more combat wings. One less lead for the remaining bombers to queue from. The groups were spaced four miles apart. The groups echeloned the bombers towards the sun's position. Additional formations were adopted in 1945 to war end. 
Formations were modified to increase ease of flying, reduce flak vulnerability, and increase bombing accuracy. If you've enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to my channel, World War II U.S. Bombers.